How does a calcium reactor work? Well, stay tuned, because we're about to talk about that right now. Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Yeah. Uh. How does a calcium reactor work? Well, you need a couple things. You need a calcium reactor of some sort, whether it's a single, dual. You need a calcium reactor. You need a CO2 tank, and you need a regulator of some sort. Now, speaking of regulators real quick, this is the carbon doser from carbondoser.com. You can go over there and check them out. The electric carbon doser makes things 10 times easier. It has numbers. You just put on numbers. What do you want? Two bubbles a second, three bubbles a second, so forth, one bubble a second, whatever. The old school, the other ones are Milwaukee, JBJ, whatever. There's multiple different kinds of uh, regulators out there. The key is, though, if you're not using this one, you want to get a regulator that actually has uh, the bubble counter attached to it. Also, with that being said, you want to make sure you fill that up with oil. Sometimes those regulators come with a little thing of oil. You fill that up. No, it doesn't go into your system. It stays right there uh, versus water. It's more, more accurate than water, okay? Water just bubbles fly right through. You're not necessarily getting a bubble that if you wanted a bubble a second, you might get three or four bubbles a second. You're not getting it. Okay, the other one, um, the bubble as it goes in, bubble, bubble. Okay, you get the point, right? Water, bubble, 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 bubble. The bubbles fly through, okay? So that is key. Write that down for you guys that are thinking about calcium reactors about make sure you get the oil for the actual bubble counter that's attached to the re regulator. If, it, if you get one that's not attached, you can buy the attachment kit and attach that. Most reactors come with their own bubble counter. This is a self-filled bubble counter. This is filled up. As soon as this fills up, water goes in here, okay? Um, I don't use this bubble counter. That bubble counter means nothing to me. Okay, besides that I have bubbles actually coming through uh, the reactor here. So, with that being said, as you start putting CO2 into the reactor, there's a reaction that happens. First off, the, the chamber itself, the fluid, the water, should I say, the CO2 goes in and drops the pH in the reactor. Yep. And as it drops the pH, anything under 7 becomes acidic, meaning it is now capable of dissolving your aragonite, your medium. As it does that, it comes out the effluent line. Now, here's my old effluent line. Usually this would attach on one chamber, and this is my fluid line. Key. Also for a fluid line. So you don't get your fluid line puckered up. I've talked about in previous videos about pinch valves and needle valves. I use really neither. Okay? I go to Home Depot and get some, uh, get one of these shutoff valves, valves for the tubing because it's way bigger opening. Less chances of clogging, especially if you have a drip rate that is really slow because you don't have a high demand yet. I use this. It's easier to dial in versus a pinch valve or a needle valve, this is 10 times easier. So make sure you do it this way. I'm just telling you from personal experience, it's easy to do it this way, okay? But 
On this system, we have the effluent line going into a second chamber. As it goes in the second chamber, the acidic water in solution, should I say, at this time, now it's, it's built up of alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, potassium, everything, coral skeleton, major and minor trace elements are now coming out, going into the second chamber. Now the second chamber is doing one thing for me. It's creating a, a more higher solution because as it leaves this first chamber at 6.8, let's just say, and goes through here, it's dissolving more and giving myself more time for utilizing the lower pH. And as it comes up, it might be from started off down here at 8, as it comes up and comes out. Now, this is my uh, line here, let's just say without the Kimura. This is now my affluent line. I would do this, same thing. But I'm utilizing a Kimura. But for those that ain't, this now is your affluent line. As 6.8 comes up, it now has a higher pH. It had more contact time, more time to uh, dissolve more media, and use up that lower pH, okay? And slowly raises the pH. Is it necessary to run a second chamber? No. I just prefer running a second chamber for that pur purpose of what I just explained. It helps raise the pH up a little bit. Also, combat low pH. A lot of people have, you know, the worries, oh my God, it's going to, you know, my pH. Yes, it, it does affect your pH a little in your main aquarium. Enough to not run one? No. If you have a problem with that, you can run a line from your intake, from your protein skimmer, out your home, outside, whatever you need to do, and pull in even more air. You can run the affluent line straight to your intake of your protein skimmer to help with the degassing of your fluid line to help raise the pH so it's not really dumping back into your system. So there's several different options if it's a, a bother to you, okay? So we're using the Kimura. The, the, the fluid line is attached to the inlet of the Kimura and the outlet of the Kimura is now my affluent line where I'm getting the drip rate. On that end, you do not need any kind of shut off valves, pinch valves, uh, needle valves, or anything of that sort. Okay? The Kimura does that. At the end of the day, I'm trying to make this video as simple as possible. I know it's hard to believe how easy it is to run a calcium reactor. I don't know why there's not been any videos out there really to make this video a long time ago. Um, it's easy. Regulator, CO2 tank. Regulator puts CO2 in here, dissolves, fluid line comes out into the chamber or out into the sump. For this purposes, this is going into the second chamber up the second chamber, then out into the sump. And there you have it. You know, you need a feed line. So, a lot of people, now for this system, because I'm using a Kimura, this line here normally would have a maxi jet 400 or ran off a manifold that you built um, underneath your uh, tank in your sump area that would feed water to this. It would push water in. That's why you need some kind of regulation on the affluent line. Pinch valve, needle valve, this little shutoff valve that you can adjust your rate. Also, these are not made to be under pressure, really. They're not. It's hard to regulate these when pushing water in. You can't really control the amount. If you're using a Maxi Jet 400, well, 
there's no knob to turn it down if you got too much going in. So you put these under pressure, you put the pump under back pressure, uh, yeah, pumps can fail because of that. I use manifold, but back in the day I've used pumps and I have had some failures with it. So the Kimura made a world of a difference. I'm not going to use the Kimura to push water in. You can because you're relate, you, you can regulate how much you're actually pushing in and you can, um, and you don't need this on your outlet of the Kimura because you're controlling what's happening here. Thus, it's going to give you the exact whatever you got it set for on this end to come out that end. Me, I'm just pulling water through the reactor as I need, at the rate I need and have my fluid line do what it needs to do at the rate that I set. Either one of those, you can do either way. I don't know if it's any kind of uh, difference on the head pressure, whether you're pulling or pushing. At the end of the day, either way is fine. But normally you would have a maxi jet of some sort, um, 1,200, 400, and you would be pushing water in here. Okay, this line is just sitting in the sump and just pulling water through because the Kimura is pulling it actually through the calcium reactor. Now, I know you guys probably thought this was going to be an exciting video. Really, it's not that exciting. Um, it's just making it easier for you guys to understand, truly understand how a reactor works. What do you need for a reactor? and setting it up. That is really it. Like I said, this dissolves over time. You do need to make sure that you have a pH probe and it is calibrated prior to um, that. Also, real quick, you do want to make sure you get the water or air, as much air out of this as possible. Okay, so the air, if you're running a second chamber, will get sucked up through this. Come down here, you need to give this a good shaking let the air go up in here and come out, purge itself, basically. If not, you will find that this whole thing's constantly full of bubbles, just, you know, just chopping up bubbles and just being sucked up by the recirculating pump and creating a, a bubble storm in the reactor. So, also real quick, <laughs> during the course of making of this video, <laughs> Broke my electric carbon doser. First off, when I tore down the old system, check valve fell, and water went up in here. I got the back off and, and destroyed the motor. First off. Second off, as I was tightening this down, there's a, a metal ring right here that is missing a chunk out of it that sits like such. I know you guys probably didn't see too well, um, but that piece came off, didn't realize as I was tightened, puckered up, destroyed this. So this can all be fixed. I can uh, order and get another part, order this part and DIY, do it myself uh, as well. Fix it at a later date. And that's what I'm going to try to do. I can utilize it for my separate system. So I had to order another one. Now these check valves here comes with the GL, but the carbon doser company actually sends you one too as well. They're the exact same. Uh, one, these you can take apart and clean them off. You need to clean these out somewhat regularly. They do get stuck sometimes, and that's what I like about these. These you can just take them apart, soak the parts in CLR because um, they do get some build up there. It's, it's uh, salt water resistance, whatever, doesn't uh, rust inside, uh, more resistant than stainless steel. So you can take the, this in, this in, just get a pair of ply. Don't put too much pressure on it, but crack them open, uh, take the parts out, soak it, soak it in CLR, give it a good rinse, 
couple of rinses because obviously you don't want to put it back and then you know water comes in contact with CLR and your salt water. And then um, it's good to go. So regular maintenance, I would say definitely make sure you guys, if you get into this, make sure you uh, maintenance that. I'm telling you, if you don't do that and water goes up in here, I think your warranty is void. These come with a three year, I believe, warranty. So make sure you do that. So that's pretty much it guys. I'm sitting here rambling on. If you guys have, uh, any, anybody has any questions, leave it in the comment section down below. But how does a calcium reactor work? That is it. I don't, like I said, I don't know why one of these videos ain't been put out sooner. But this is video is to uh, made simple. You know, how does a calcium reactor work? Made simple. So, with that being said, thanks for everybody stopping in, watching this video. If you're not subscribed yet to the channel, make sure you go ahead and subscribe. Hit that notification bell for any future updates. And with that being said, peace.